approach the eternal throne, I was listening to a song this morning about the Passover and how the high priest once a year would go into the most holy of holies. And the song was a bit of a story or narrative through the, the feelings that high priest was experiencing on such a day. And, you know, preparations began uh, months before and the high priest was chosen and selected and the day before there's anticipation and preparation and the fear, the privilege and the honor it is to be chosen as high priest to go into God's presence. But the fear equated with it, having a strap around your ankle, if you make one wrong move and, and you're killed and you have to be dragged out. Um, and boldly, boldly, we approach the eternal throne. We come before the presence of God. That's a phenomenal thing. And it's through the blood and sacrifice of Christ. It's a beautiful thing. Well, please turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 7 through verse 13. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Father, I ask that this morning you would glorify your name. Glorify your name, Lord, through teaching us, Father, what we do not know. Lord, showing us what we do not see. Lord, transforming us, even this morning, into greater degrees of Christ-likeness. Father, it is for the sake of Christ that I ask this. Amen. Well, this morning, in light of next weekend's revival prayer meeting, I thought it would be timely to take both this morning and next Sunday morning, God willing, time to consider the words of Christ here in Matthew chapter 6. This is classically called the Lord's Prayer. Prayer, And in this prayer where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, there are seven petitions. Now a petition is a request. There are seven requests that Jesus teaches us to bring before the Lord. And the first three, as we will concern ourselves with this morning, are kingdom concerns. What I mean by that is they are primarily a concern for God, a concern for his glory, and his honor. And it is no coincidence that Jesus begins this model prayer, if you like, this, this, this demonstration of prayer, by front-loading it with kingdom concerns. He, he puts kingdom concerns on the front burner in teaching us how to pray. And we have in this prayer the elements of what make up God-honoring prayer. It's absolutely vital that we understand this. If we are to be a praying church, if we're to be praying people, praying Christians, it's absolutely vital that we understand what effective prayer is and how to pray effectively. Here we've been given this remarkable privilege, this ushering in to the courts of heaven. God is telling You and I, come here. I want you to join in to the decision-making of this universe. He's actually bringing us in and saying, 
ask of me things and I'll do them. If you don't ask, you have not because you ask not. Ask, I'll give it to you. We actually play a part in the goings on of this universe. What a remarkable thing prayer is. Listen to Jesus in John 15. John 15, 16, he says, You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, your fruit should last. So that, why did you choose us, Jesus? Why did you appoint us to go forth and bear fruit? So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus Christ, we've been chosen by him in order that we would pray and have our prayers answered. What an incredible thing prayer is. Isn't that phenomenal? I chose you. Why would you choose me? So you would pray and have them answered. Well, how vital then is it that we understand how we ought to pray? The world does not understand this. The world does not know how to pray. You see, the world prays like this. Give me this. Mm, Don't do that. Do this. I want this. I don't want that anymore. Okay, I'll take it. You take this. I want more of this. That's how the world prays, isn't it? Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. They don't understand prayer. They pray in order to satisfy their lusts, in order to fulfill their delights, their carnal delights, their cravings for self-glorification, for self-gratification, That's how the world world prays. And brethren, we ought not to pray like the world. And if we're not going to pray like the world, we must then learn how to pray. So this morning we come to the Lord's Prayer. Although some would contend this should be called the Disciples' Prayer, I'm of a mind uh, to agree with that contention. Uh, It is, after all, a model prayer for the disciples, um, teaching us, how to pray, but regardless if you call it the Lord's Prayer, Disciples' Prayer, we come to this model prayer. Jesus is teaching us how to pray, and this morning we will consider from our Lord's instructions, first of all, the God whom we address in prayer, the God whom we address in prayer, and secondly, the central concern of our prayer. So first, consider with me the God whom we address in prayer. Look there in verse 9. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven. Notice this, Our Father. What does this signify? Corporate or group prayer. We're set next weekend for this revival prayer. In this very room, we will gather and together in a unified voice, pray to the Lord. We're going to bring our petitions, our thanksgivings, our pleadings with God together corporately. And here Jesus is assuming corporate prayer among the saints. This shouldn't surprise us then that in Paul's instructions to 1 Timothy, as he says, Timothy, I'm giving you these things so that you may know how to conduct yourselves as a church corporately. The first instruction he gives is corporate prayer. That shouldn't surprise us. The prayer meeting, the church gathering to pray, Jesus assumes that here with that very first word, our Father. Now you say, does this mean Jesus is excluding individual prayer? Well, certainly not. Look up at verse 6. He says, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So individual secret prayer is essential but we ought also to pray together as a church. Now, brothers and sisters, this alone, this word alone, this seeing Christ here, as we go through this, this week and next week, Jesus doesn't use words flippantly. Every word is calculated. Every word is meaningful. And here he says, our, and this alone ought to expand in our minds the absolute essential, essential essential nature of the prayer meeting, the gathering together of the saints. We have prayer meetings each week, Wednesday, Friday nights. This alone, Jesus says, you want to pray? Pray like this, our Father. 
he's assuming a corporate prayer. This ought to expand in our minds the essential nature of gathering together as a church to pray. But note further, our Father in heaven. Father is the new covenant name for God. In the Old Testament, the term Father is used very rarely when referring to God. In fact, in the whole of the New Testament, you look at the major portion of your scriptures, it's used 15 times in all of the Old Testament referring to him as Father. But here in the New Testament, we see Father as one of the most common names referenced by Jesus for God. And here in our immediate context in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls God Father 17 times. In the the rest of Matthew, over 40 times. Now think about this for a moment. Jesus refers to God as Father. What does it mean that God is our Father? Well, in the first sense, in the very basic fundamental sense, He's Creator. So in that sense, we are His children. Don't turn there, but listen, listen to Paul speaking to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17. He says, even actually quoting some of their modern day poets, he says, um, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. We are God's offspring. So in that basic fundamental sense, when Jesus is referring to the Father, there is that sense where simply being created by him, we're his children, his offspring. But secondly, and I'd argue uh, the, the greater thrust of this use is the fact that we, he is our father through Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 8, when we are saved, we become co-heirs or fellow heirs with Christ. This means that all of the glories of the eternal inheritance of heaven that Christ has is shared with us. Jesus is the Son of God by nature. We become the sons and daughters of God by adoption. We are now children of God. Listen to Paul in Romans 8.15. Listen to this. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you know what this means? You know what this means? That Jesus Christ says, when you pray, you say, our Father. He doesn't say, when I pray, I'm gonna, guys, I'm going to say Father because he's my Father. But when you pray, say God. He says, when you pray, say, Father, you know what this means? It means that you are brought into an intimate father-son, father-daughter relationship with the God of this universe. The very relationship that he shares with Jesus Christ, you share with the Father. You're a fellow heir. You're a co-heir with Christ. That is amazing. Not only have we been saved from our sins, born again, created new, we've been adopted as children of God. You know we were once children of Satan, following the course of this world, doing the desires and wills of Satan. Satan, you were his child. And when God saves you, he says, you're mine. You're adopted. You're brought in. He doesn't simply justify you and say, fine, no hell. He lays the gavel, says, not guilty. Now you, come here. You're moving in with me. You're now my child. I embrace you. That's a phenomenal reality. And now here is an excellent point for us to stop and examine ourselves. Can you address God as Father with intimacy? Can you? Is it a frequent address? Do you at all? And if you can't, why can't you? Why don't you? Do you have a defective view of the fatherhood of God? Are you projecting on God unjustly 
a marred, broken view of fatherhood because of your earthly father who perhaps was a failure, who perhaps didn't fulfill the requirements you expected him to fulfill as a father. Are you taking that projection and putting it on God unjustly and saying, well, my idea of what a father is, I don't like a father, so I'm not going to call God father. Believer, do not project such notions of fatherhood onto your father in heaven. He is the epitome of perfect fatherhood, reflecting nothing of the broken, marred images of fathers that are displayed all around us in our lives and in the lives of others. Don't maintain this distant, austere view of a cold relationship with God. He is close. He's brought you in. Everything your earthly father wasn't, he is. He's the epitome of perfect fatherhood. And here Christ is saying, Christian, recognize it. And for you, believer, you and I this morning, don't miss out on so much that is there for us in the fatherhood of God. Know him as a father. Know him intimately. Wake up each morning and run to him as a father runs into his child's arms. Know this love. Take advantage of it. Bask in it. Know the intimacy of God as Father. If you're struggling with that picture, and you say, I just don't know what a father is, go to Scripture, find what a good father is, and in spite of your earthly father's failures, define the fatherhood of God from the truth of God's Word. And take advantage of it. That is the name that, or the reference that Jesus gives to God. But further, notice this, the next word, our Father in heaven. Notice where our Father is as we are praying to him. He's in heaven. And this ought to provide us a beautiful balance in prayer. And you say, a beautiful balance. What do you mean a beautiful balance? Well, think of it. The address of Jesus, our Father in heaven, or I'm sorry, our Father, it shows the imminence of God. What's imminence? The closeness. He's intimate with us. We are like children, speaking tenderly to our kind, loving Father. And yet, this Father, so close and intimate, where is He? He's in heaven. This shows us the transcendence of God, the superiority, the greatness, the grandeur. He is so far above us. And Jesus, by opening his prayer this way, is contrasting the almighty loftiness and incomprehensible, mind-blowing superiority of God with his tender, intimate nearness to us. He's putting these two realities next to each other. The mind-blowing superiority, it's incomprehensible. God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He's ruling. He puts that right next to his intimate, tenderly, fatherly care. Of us. Now, what does this say to us then? I said this, this presents us a beautiful balance in prayer. What do you mean a balance? What does this say to us about how we are to approach God? Well, it gives us two ditches to avoid. Ditch number one, we must avoid cowering. Approaching God as an angry slave driver who's irritable, quick-tempered, coming to God fearful, cowering, thinking at any moment he's just going to smite me. This takes us right back to Romans 8. What does he say in Romans 8? You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. As, As a great man of God once said, the opposite of slavish fear is filial confidence. There's the fear of a slave before his master. Okay, I'm going to get whipped if I don't do the exact right thing. He's irritable. He's angry. The opposite of that is a filial confidence, knowing that's my father. That's daddy. I can run to him. I can run into his arms. Now think of this. The awakened sinner, the awakened sinner ought to have that fear, ought to have an approach to God with fear. Why? Because the wrath of God abides on them. If they were to die in that condition, they will be tormented day and night in the presence of the Holy Lamb and His angels. There ought to be a cowering fear of 
the awakened sinner. But brothers and sisters, when you have been brought into a peaceful relationship through the blood of Christ, that spirit of slave, slavish fear is cast away. Now you have filial confidence. You approach God as a father. He washed you clean of your filthy record. He replaces your dirty heart with a heart that loves him to serve him. And he welcomes you into his home and gives you not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love. And so we ought to approach God in prayer as our father. Filial affection, not slavish fear. First ditch to avoid, the cowering. But here's the second ditch to avoid. We must avoid the over-familiarity that is so prevalent in our day today. Approaching God as a buddy, as a good old pal, with whom we share laughs and jokes. Opening God's word with no reverence, no fear, no sobriety. You see men standing behind the pulpit opening, beginning with jokes. It's entertainment. We approach God as, oh yeah, he's just, he's just our old friend. He's our buddy. Oh, that ought not to be. The preacher of Ecclesiastes sets this straight. Listen to this. Ecclesiastes 5.2 Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Here's that balance. Oh, he's your father, but know where he is. You're on the earth. He is in heaven. Be not hasty. Be not rash. Yes, he is near and intimate and close, but he is also king. Our approach to God ought to be then that of Psalm 2.11. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. It's coming to him with a reverence, with a filial affection, but a reverence that this God is in heaven. So then, that is the God whom we address in prayer, our corporate, our corporate Father who abides in heaven. This shapes from the start how we are to even approach prayer. It is to be both private and corporate, Neglecting either the secret place of prayer or the gathered meetings of prayer is here exposed. Both are critical. It is not either or, it is both and. Thus, when we speak of being a people of prayer, brothers and sisters, we want to be a people of prayer. We want to be a church of prayer. We want a prayer culture. What do we mean? We mean that as individuals, we are to be well acquainted with the prayer closet in the mornings, through the days, in the nights, And as a church body, we are to gather together throughout the week to bring our praises, thanksgivings, requests before the throne in a unified voice. Individually acquainted, well acquainted with our prayer closets, corporately gathering throughout the week to bring our voices unified before the Lord. So that's how Jesus Christ begins this instruction to pray. Let us consider then secondly the central concern of our prayer. Look down in verse 6 or 6 verse 9. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first central concern of our prayer is his name. What does hallowed mean? Literally it means to make holy purify, consecrate, to venerate. It means to regard with great respect, to revere. When someone comes into town, comes into presence, comes into your office, comes into the building, and you revere them, there's respect and honor, right? So he says, hallowed. That literally means revered, made famous, acknowledged, glorified, be your name. Jesus is saying, Father, make great your name. Make your name revered, honored, glorified, famous be your name. Now in scripture, names are given much greater significance than we give them today, right? I saw it first of Isaac. You know what Isaac means? It means to laugh, laughter. Well, why would God command Abraham and Sarah to name their son Isaac? Well, remember what Abraham did when God said, you're going to have a son? He laughed. He fell on his face and laughed. Sarah overheard the messenger of the Lord saying, you're going to have a son. She laughed and she denied it. 
you look, there's more laughter in that narrative. You look at the narrative of Isaac's birth, and there's, there's an interesting story of laughter. Well, God says, name him Isaac. Really? Name him laughter. His name meant something. Why? Because every time that name is spoken, it's a constant reminder that Isaac's birth was contrary to nature itself, that God did the miraculous to give him life. And all over scripture you see these names with weighty significance and meaning. Think of Esau. You know what Esau means? It means hairy. You know what Moses means? Moses means drawn. Why would Moses mean drawn? Because Pharaoh's daughter saw him in the, in the river and drew him out. So she named him Moses. I drew him out. So there's significance. There's, there's weight behind names in scripture. And Jesus here prays, hallowed be your name. Think with me for a second about the names of God in Scripture. They represent everything He is. They represent His entire being. Jehovah. Yahweh. Jehovah. When you see in your Old Testament, Lord, in all capitals, it's the name Yahweh or Jehovah. And it reflects the absolute self-existence of God. The one who in Himself possesses essential life. Remember we spoke about essential life last week? Yahweh represents permanent existence, alone, self-existent, dependent upon nothing and no one. That's Yahweh when you see that in your Bibles. El Shaddai, often translated God Almighty. It signifies the all-powerful God who's all-sufficient and all-bountiful. The one from whom all blessings flow. He's the all-sufficient sustainer and provider. That's El Shaddai, Almighty. You'll see that translated God Almighty. How about Adonai? Adonai means master or Lord. It signifies God's ownership all over all creation. And it demands, this title itself, Adonai itself, demands obedience from all mankind. Listen to Deuteronomy 10 and 17. He says, the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. Literally, Adon of lords. The mighty and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. I love that. He is God over all. If there's a Lord, he is Lord of lords. He is King of kings, Adonai, master of all. How about Elohim? It means strength, power. It signifies God's transcendence, his but he's above all as creator and judge of the universe. It puts on display his supreme power and total sovereignty. These are phenomenal going through the names of God and saying, why are they using different names? It signifies everything who he is. We could go on and on. And Jesus is saying, when you pray, pray that God's name, the essence of who he is, would be honored, hallowed, made famous. That God, as Jehovah, the only source of life, essential life, would be known among men. That a dying world would know of and honor the one who alone can provide eternal life. That's Jehovah. Pray, Lord, hallowed be your name, Jehovah. That this dying world that is perishing would know the one who is life. That God, as El Shaddai, the one from whom all gifts are bestowed, the one who sends rain upon the wicked and ungrateful, the source and supplier of all blessings, would be praised by men with thanksgiving and hearts of gratitude. Lord, you give all good gifts. I pray, hallowed be El Shaddai, that men, when they receive these blessings, would not take them selfishly for their own works, but would praise you as the source of them. That God as Adonai would be bowed to, feared, revered. That Elohim, the almighty creator and judge, would be worshipped as such. By praying, hallowed be your name, we are asking that the essence of God, who he is, may be made known and glorified. Brothers and sisters, this is the very meaning of petition. A burning desire to see God's name magnified, to see God's name glorified, revered, honored, praised, worshipped among all men. It's the, it's the essence of what petition is. This is the chief 
concern. Think about it. You once had zero concern for the glory of God. You sat on the throne of your life concerned for your glory. The things you did, even those so-called good works you did, you did them for whom? For yourself. To glorify yourself. Lift yourself in the eyes of men. You didn't give a care in the world for the glory of God. And he saved you. And what then becomes your chief concern? That God's name would be magnified. Ask yourself, is this, is this your chief concern? Is this your supreme desire to see God's name magnified? Jesus puts this at the very forefront of the disciples' prayer. It's the very first petition Jesus teaches us to pray. Is it at the forefront of your prayers? Regardless of circumstance, it ought to be. Regardless as to why you entered into the prayer closet that afternoon, this ought to be at the forefront of your name, burning in your heart. Father, glorify, hallowed be your name. Whether you entered the prayer closet that morning with tears streaming down your face, saying, Lord, I just, please, let mother live just a little longer. Don't take her so soon. Or whether you entered pleading, Lord, take this from me. Take this trial. Take this thorn from my side. Father, give me a spouse. Give me a husband. Give me a wife. Regardless of why you entered the prayer closet that afternoon, your greatest desire ought to be that this glorious God should be honored, worshipped, praised, and revered before anything else. Father, hallowed be your name, it ought to be the resounding chorus of your heart. So we see that how the Lord is teaching us to pray is essentially that in spite of the situations confronting us or the needs before us, our primary occupation and chief concern is to see his name glorified. It is above any other desire in the believer's life. Think of then of Peter in 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4.11, he says, Whoever serves as one who sp- or speaks, whoever sp- as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves by the strength that God supplies, why? In order that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. In order that in everything God would be glorified. This ought to be your primary occupation. Wasn't that the concern of Jesus? Now, brothers and sisters, this is foundational. If we are to pray, you can pray in so many ways, but if this is not the forefront, if this is not the foundation, if you do not have as the burning desire in your heart above all other things, I would dare say above salvation. Think of Romans chapter 9. It glorifies God to damn men. Before salvation... Your chief concern and greatest desire is that his name would be glorified. Father, save them. Save them. Glorify your name, Lord, in their salvation. But Father, make your name great. However he chooses to glorify his name, this ought to be the burning passion of your heart. And if you as a believer want to emulate your Savior, wasn't this his greatest concern? Didn't he pray in John 12, Father, glorify your name? Otherwise, I'll tell you this, if you pray and have no care for the glory of God, do you know what it says about you? You're praying because you still want glory. Oh yeah, I'll use God for, to get things to lift me up. Oh, the true believer has a burning zeal, passion, to see God's name glorified before anything else. It's why Christ says, when you pray, put this first. Petition number one, glorify your name, Father. Well then, we ought to ask the question, how will this be done? How will God's name be hallowed? And that is precisely what Jesus goes on to answer in verse 10. Consider with me the second central concern of our prayer, his kingdom. Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this makes perfect sense. 
He's just asked the Lord to make his name famous. It makes perfect sense that he would follow this up with a petition, a request to God that his kingdom would come. And you say, well, why? Well, in order to answer that question, we've got to know what is the kingdom of God. When Jesus asks God to bring his kingdom or cause his kingdom to come, what is it specifically that he's requesting? Well, certainly contained in this prayer or in this request for the kingdom certainly could be the petition of the Apostle Paul that we find on the last page of our scriptures, right? Come, Lord Jesus. There's a desire. Come, bring your consummate kingdom. Bring heaven quickly. And certainly it is right to pray that way. We ought to pray, Lord, bring your kingdom, please come as we look around this world. But I don't believe that's what Jesus is teaching us to pray here. I believe the kingdom of which Jesus is teaching us to pray is the advancement of the kingdom of God in the gospel. If you look at the end of verse 10, look there at verse, the end of verse 10, you see that Jesus brackets both of these petitions as desires for the here and now. He says, on earth as it is in heaven, right? So yes, the prayer for God's consummate kingdom to come is a right and good prayer, but it's just not the, the focus Jesus has here. Here, he's focusing on the kingdom of God in the form of the gospel to come to earth now. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God is among us or within us. Why? Because it's the reign of God in the hearts of men. As men and women are brought to the end of themselves, as men and women are awakened to their sin, realizing I can do no good, I cannot earn my way to heaven, they, they come to the end of themselves and they bow before the throne and the Holy Spirit re gives them a new birth, changes their heart, removes their old heart, gives them a new heart, salvation, right? What happens? Well, they're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. They're transferred from being children of Satan to children of God. They're transferred from being on the throne of their own life, removing themselves and putting Christ on the throne. So we see that God, that Adonai, Master and Lord, is now, when someone is saved, that now the ruler, the reign in their hearts. This is the kingdom of God. It is the reign of God in the hearts of men and women. So when Jesus is asking here, Lord, bring your kingdom, thy kingdom come, we're praying a missionary prayer. It's pleading with God to advance his gospel in power and victory, to speed it ahead and to be honored. Remember that prayer of Paul? Lord, advance your kingdom. Let your words be honored. That's what this is. So first of all, in our own hearts, we're praying, Lord, bring your kingdom. First of all, in our own hearts, Lord, bring your reign into me. More and more that I would lay down my life at the foot of the cross and present myself as a living sacrifice. But the thrust of this prayer is a missionary prayer. That his kingdom would extend. That his reign would extend to the souls of those living in the world around us. This is a prayer, as Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it, for the success of the gospel, its sway and power. I love that. So we're praying for the success, for its sway and its power. And we will gather in a week's time and collectively bring this petition before our Father in heaven. O oh, Father, advance your kingdom. Inside these four walls, advance your kingdom to the unconverted of this church who attend week in and week out. Father, advance your reign. Oh, Father, advance your kingdom in Laredo. Advance your kingdom in South Texas. Lord, advance your kingdom in America at large. Lord, advance your kingdom in the nations. This is our prayer, that to the ends of the earth, your kingdom come, O oh God. And guess what? As his kingdom reign extends, what happens to his name? It's hallowed. It's glorified all the more. As his peace and joy is abundantly distributed to hurting souls, what's the response? They join the chorus of praise extending to the heavens. They cry out to their neighbors and their families and their co-workers and their cities and their, those on the streets, they cry out to them of 
the greatness of this God. They sing blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. They join the chorus of heaven as you did when you were saved. That glorifies, that magnifies the name of God. So then we come to the third and final central concern of our prayer that we will consider this morning. And that is His will. Look there in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have just learned to pray first and foremost that God's name be hallowed. We then pray that it would be This would be accomplished by the coming of the kingdom in the hearts of men through the gospel of Jesus. What comes next? Your will be done. And it's a perfectly logical sequence. Think about it. The result of the coming of the kingdom of God amongst men will be that the will of God is done by men. And when we speak of God's will here, this is important. We're not speaking of the decorative will of God. Decorative will. You say, what's that? The decrees. Or, or the decreed will of God from the end, knowing the end from the beginning. In Isaiah 46.10, God tells us, I, have, I know the end from the beginning. The decorative will. God has decreed what is going to come to pass. He knows it. He's above it. He's ordained it. He's outside of time. We're not talking about that will, that everything done is in his will. The will of God, of which Jesus is speaking, is the preceptive will of God. Precepts the revealed laws and commandments that we are instructed to keep. When the kingdom of God comes among men, they are changed from law breakers into law keepers. The evil they used to do, they no longer do. So when Jesus, doesn't it make perfect sense? Lord, glorify your name. Okay, well, how's that going to be done? By God reigning in the hearts of men, they join the chorus of the heavens, glorifying him. Okay, well, what's next? Well, your will be done. Obedience, righteousness. Turn over, perhaps, a page in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. You'll see that this is the very problem of those who stood before God in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Look at this. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The kingdom of God did not come among these men. You say, how can you tell? Because they did not do his will. The kingdom of God, as the reign of God in men's hearts, will necessarily produce men and women who are actively doing the will of their Father in heaven. So when Jesus instructs us to pray that the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven, what is the heart, what is the core, what's the essential motive of that prayer it's a prayer that god's laws may be honored here among men on earth as they are in heaven there's perfect obedience in heaven and jesus is saying pray that that perfect obedience pray that that righteousness comes to earth now therefore listen it is a prayer for righteousness for us lord we've been brought into your kingdom. You reign in our life. Now, Lord, make us more holy. And this ought to be the desire of every true child of God, to walk in righteousness, actively obeying the will of God with all of your heart, mind, and soul. Loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. So as we come next week to pray, we are going to front load our prayers, kingdom concerns, Father, glorify your name. Yes, we're going to pray for revival. We're going to pray for salvation. But Lord, your, your name be glorified, whether that means the salvation of men or their condemnation. Father, above all, first and foremost, glorify your name. But Father, we do ask that your kingdom would come. Oh, glorify your name through the salvation of souls. And further, Father, I pray that your will would be done in us, in our hearts as believers. Revive us again. 
Lord, this sloth that has overcome us, this laziness in the Christian life, Lord, do away with it. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bring righteousness to your church. Cause us to walk in greater righteousness. That is the burning desire. That's what Jesus is teaching you to pray. But let us be a praying church. A praying church that knows how to pray. A praying church that has, as its burning passion, a a desire to see God's name glorified above all else. A church consumed with a zeal to see the gospel advance. A church that is burdened for revival both in our own souls and in the souls of others. Amen. Father.